Hello, we are the David Proudy Envirothon team here, and um, we did our project on, or centered in Spencer, Massachusetts, although we come from Spencer and East Brookfield. My name is Jackson Paul. This is Nicole Cummings. This is Anna Jung. This is Amanda Wozniak. And then there's Jen Wozniak. And we have Yvonne Bonyai, Anna Bogdan, and Tim Tren. So to start off our project, we did some research by interviewing people. The first person we interviewed was Ann Gobi, and she is the chair of the Joint Committee of Agriculture, and she's also an advocate for community food security. She gave us a brief history of our state, and she told us that Massachusetts is down to 160 dairy farms currently. And she told us that there's been a big switch in what people want to do, and that basically entails leaving farming, mainly because farms don't make much money, and there's limited tax break on farmers, so it's hard to make a huge income. One of the solutions that she told us to help with sustainable agriculture was that people need to realize that farms are in our backyard. And that just means that people need to either buy more locally or even produce food in their own yard and have their own small farm in their backyard. And people also just have to change their own habits by reducing food waste and energy waste. One interesting thing that she told us was that Massachusetts and Rhode Island are the only two states that has an increase of farmland. And there's also been an increase in woman farming, which was interesting to hear about. And some people who are never have done farming before are getting into it due to diversity. And on the topic at hand, sustainability, she gave us her own personal view on it. And she told us that it's something in place that isn't just for today. It's something that's going to last. So one way to go about that is to look at the climate and see how to react from that because that has an impact on the soil and the crops that you should grow because of that. And it's just reduce, reuse, recycle. She really impounded that on us. The next person we interviewed was Margaret Washburn. She's a town soil specialist and the conservation commission member. She told us a couple of things, but one of the questions we asked her was about locally farmed food. And what do they use for fertilizer, whether it's organic or chemicals, just to get an idea of what our town uses. And she told us that they haven't done a questionnaire or a survey on it, and that's what they would have to do to give us a good answer. But they gave us more of a background on, or an understanding of the different fertilizers. And she told us that organic matter as a fertilizer, rather than chemical-based, reduces the carbon print, and it's better for the environment. But it's also more expensive and farmer, harder for farmers to get a hand, their hands on it. And she gave us examples of farms to interview and look at, and one of them was Breezy Gardens, which Jen will mention. We also asked her about GMOs, and we had a conversation on the pros and cons of these. And one thing she told us was that while they seem bad in theory, some of them are okay to an extent. One that she's okay with is a GMO that makes corn resistant to the corn airworm because that means that less pesticide has to be used on the crops and that's better for the environment. The next person we interviewed was Ginny Scarlett and she's the founder of the Common Ground Land Trust in Spencer and Lester. And she's into sustainable forestry and the preservation of farms. What she told us was about the APR, the Agriculture Preservation Restriction, which helps farmers buy land and how that works is developmental land costs so much more than agricultural land, so it's harder for farmers to purchase it. So the APR allows them to purchase the land for the agricultural sale price, and the state pays the difference between the developmental land price and the agricultural, so that the seller gets the full amount, and then that land can never be developed on again. And for her take on sustainability, she just said that sustainability means it takes care of the soil so that the soil is good to be used for years to come. The next person we interviewed was John Michak. He's the farmer at Small Farm. And he's been farming since 1980 at the Small Farm. And that supplies to Breezy and Lester. He said it's enough to make a living. And his kids were offered the opportunity to return to the farm after finishing college, but they all declined the offer. They said, while they appreciate the lifestyle, it's just a whole lot of work for a little money. 
And that just gave us a little idea of how younger people are viewing the prospect of going to farming as a career. It just isn't happening very often and it gives an idea of why. So he told us that the business at Breezy Gardens started with them and it's going to stop with them. But they are working on buying small farm through an APR. He also gave us a brief history on the town and he told us through the 60s and 70s there were 12 dairy farms in Spencer but that has decreased down to one and I believe it is the Pilling Farm but there's only one dairy farm left in Spencer. And on the idea of sustainability, he told us his take on it. He said organic can't feed the world. While organic farming seems good in theory, it's not that sustainable. So he relies somewhere on a middle ground. And how he goes about that is something called IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And that's farming that manages resources such as pests, weeds, soil, and water with the least adverse effect on the environment. And how he goes about that one way is he tests for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash in the soil and gets a custom blended mix to replenish his soil instead of just putting down random fertilizer. It gives him a better idea of what the soil needs for what he needs to grow. And that's better for the environment in the soil. And pest management, where that comes in, his, the owners of the farm currently don't want them to hurt the animals living on the farm, such as gophers, which he told us like to eat some of his crops. How he goes about that is he has Jim the bug guy, and he scouts for insects and discusses the finding. As an IPM um, farm, they accept up to 10% damage. After that, they spray with crop protectors. So if they have a lot of damage, they spray, and if they don't, they don't have to. Um, one thing that they told us was they have the pheromone traps in the farm. We always wondered what those were because we saw the nets sitting out there. And one thing that we thought was pretty cool, that's how they use it to see how much pesticide they have to use. If there's more moths caught in the trap, that means they have to spray more. But they could also tell from the amount of moss in there how far along the crop is. If the crop is more developed, they won't have to spray and they'll just harvest it sooner. And if it's a baby crop, they'll have to spray if there's more. The next person we interviewed was Charlene Lunen, and she's a producer, food producer at Oak Hill Greenhouse. And they start plants from seeds, grow them up to seedlings, transplant and raise them up to big plants. And they sell the seedlings and plants to local businesses and um, private buyers. And they just ship them out through trucks. And the last person we interviewed was Eric Berthroom. He is a third generation dairy farmer on the Agricultural Commission, which is newly formed in our town. And he went to the Stockbridge School for Farming and came back to try running the family farm on his own. It's just a small operation. And he's the only one of his friends who came from a farming family to do so. And that just gave us another idea of younger people's perspective on farming. While gathering research for our presentation, we visited a variety of farms, all connected to sustainable agriculture. One such farm was owned by Mr. Barnett. He lived in a marsh and was concerned with ecosystem health as he managed his food growing operations. When he first purchased the land, his wife asked him what he would farm. And he replied, I don't know, I'll let the land speak to me. And that's what he did. Because of the moist and shady land he owns, he decided to grow mushrooms. And he does this in two ways. He does this by poking holes in logs and placing mushroom spores inside and then sealing them with hot wax, which is pictured right here. And then underneath it, you can see the second method of his farming where he places reed canary grass, which is a relatively useless plant that grows on his property. And he places it inside his chicken feed bags, which recycles. And he places in the mushroom spores. And after a year, the logs sprout shiitake mushrooms and the chicken feed bags grow oyster mushrooms. It was an interesting farm to visit because of the nature of the farm and the fact that he lived completely off the grid. Another cool place we toured was St. Joseph's Abbey, which is run by the Spencer Monks. And it's located right here on our map. And it's right here on our poster. Here is an old picture of the layout of the land. And the monks are food growers that use innovative strategies for economic viability. They're most known for the Trappist jams, 
which can be found at the grocery stores um, locally. And they're also known for their newly opened brewery, which, from what I've heard, produces a decent beer that has made its way all the way to the shelves in Boston. The monks also do forestry and in turn use lumber to run their biomass furnace, which supplies energy for electricity. A focal point of our research was local agriculture, and we found two farms that process, store, and distribute produce uh, for local consumption. The first location was the small farm, and that is rented by the Michek family. And here's a picture of the small farm, and it is located right here on our map of Spencer. The Michek family have been renting the small farm since 1980, and they utilize the diverse soil of the 70-acre land well. The land is made up of Upland Hill, Hinkley, and Sadbury soil, and only 56 acres are actually good for farming. The Micheks own Breezy Gardens in Leicester, which is located right here on our map. And this is where they sell their produce. The second farm that we found was Triple Oaks Farm, which I have several pictures for right here and they farm maple syrup. Royal Crest was a farm we researched that recycles food waste into compost and supplies a variety of services to local farms, homeowners, and landscape contractors. And here's just a variety of pictures I pulled from their site and they're located right here in Spencer. The last farm we toured was one of the most interesting. They focused on renewable energy within their dairy farm by mixing manure from their cows with food waste from the surrounding areas in their anaerobic digester to produce a fertilizer that they used on their fields. And this is pictured right here. That is the anaerobic digester. And in these three pictures, you can actually see them spraying their farms with the fertilizer they produce. And this farm is Jordan Farm. And they have two locations. The anaerobic digester is located in Rutland, Mass. And in the Rutland location, that is where they have their dairy farm, where they supply over 16,000 gallons of milk a day to Gorelick Farms in Franklin, Mass. And I actually have a poster that we found in our school cafeteria. And it's just asking everyone to support New England dairy farmers. And Jordan Farm is an ex excellent example of um, New England dairy farms. And we actually drink Gorelick milk at our high school, so we thought that was pretty cool. And in their Spencer location, that is where they raise their baby cows, and they also grow turkeys to be sold for local consumption. In a brief history of Spencer Farms and sustainability, I will start off with Alta Crest Farm, um, which is right here. This small farm has since become St. Joseph's Abbey, um, a sustainable monastery in our town that produces both jams and beer. Next we have um, the Spencer Fairgrounds, which was once called Merrick Park. Uh, it has since been converted to the infamous, obviously, Spencer's Fairgrounds, which hosts an annual fair in September every year. This land's slow conversion to an agricultural and entertainment-based attraction area has greatly benefited the community. Several other events take place here throughout the year, including Spencer Family Fun Day. This here is Bemis Farms. Um, at one point it was a small apple orchard and family operated farm, but it has since evolved into a commercial nursery, which attracts a number of uh, floral enthusiasts and runs a, quite a thriving operation. So, Bemis. Here we have Zucas Farm, down at the bottom. Uh, as you can see, Zucas Farm is one of our most classical examples of a piece of land that has withstood the test of time and development. It was once a dairy farm, but it, said, but it has since been converted into actually a wedding venue that's uh, pretty popular in the area. So this here is Sibley Farms, before and after. Um, it, it was once a, a big farm used for dairy and, and just in general it was sort of the definitive sustainable land in, in Spencer. But now it is open space used for recreation 
and uh, um, it, it's it's open obviously to the public, both of Spencer and of surrounding towns. The Wilson farm was an example of a farm that turned into a solar farm, which is a picture right there. It's not a solar farm, and it um, it's kind of like an example where which which like um res like sustainable resource is better than the other like farming or like conserving energy like that kind of thing and I think we need to balance it and um, um, St. Joseph's Abbey is like self-sufficient and it's still like a farming they like even though people live there like they still use it for farming and so so does um, Jordan Farms which is right here which was what Jen mentioned earlier and um, there are um, still farming in um, Spencer, even though there aren't that many much soil that's good. And um, the best soil we found in, was Hinkley soil, which was at the um, small farm, in, um, which is right here on the map. The small farms, it was um, what Jen said, used for sibling, the, um, the breezy gardens. <coughs> And um, the Hinkley soil was like w well irrigated, and compared to the Sudbury soil, which was um, poorly irrigated, and it got always got flooded over because it was um, there was like a river near it, and like it always got like flooded when it rained and everything. So it was kind of bad for that. And um, the best website we found on sustainable local agriculture for people in our community who want to take action was www.common groundlt.org. We actually met with one of the founding members, Mrs. Virginia Scarlett, who is also a soil specialist. The website is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to open space protection in our town of Spencer and the surrounding town of Leicester, Mass. In October 2012, it was able to raise over $650,000 to save Sibley and Warner Farms in Spencer. That's Sib um, Sibley Farms right there, and it's a little poster on how it was saved. And um, virtually anyone can join as a member and vote in on the organized elections. The group holds fun, fun gatherings like hikes and cleanups. One example of good news for sustainable local agriculture we found in, in an article was on the St. Joseph Abbey. The Abbey has been chronicled on the news, bringing in a great deal of traction and business. Most importantly, the Abbey has made sure to incorporate a number of sustainability features in the design, construction, and operation of the brewery. The bad media report we found was the NOAA news story on climate impacts and how there is a growing fear of global warming. It warns that there is an El Nino coming. Also shown were the maps displaying the warm, warming where and when it will occur. We were led to our unexpected finds by Mrs. Virginia Scarlett. NESoil.com was one of them. It's really cool. Once you click our state, Massachusetts, it has a colored picture of the state, which allows you to click the region you live in, thus leading you to an overview of soil and a list of other environment topics with links. The other neat website we were led to was the hubbardbrook.org. I swear you could spend hours on there. It has webcams out in different locations in nature, and they have specific pages for researchers, educators, and students, and visitors too. Finally, I would like to give a brief explanation on what we did for our community service project for Envirothon. We actually set up a seed library at our local library, Richard Sugden. Um, we did this in order to encourage the usage or the, pr or the practice of private farming, of biodiversity, non-GMO crops, local plant diversity, as well as prevention of future plant extinctions and possibly bringing plants back if so desired in the future. This is a picture of the seed library as well as this right here. And we have a little article about seed libraries on the poster as well.